Good morning. Uh, my name is Jane Binion. We're really pleased to be here as part of the Lancashire Innovation Festival. And during this session, we're looking at women and micro manufacturing. And we're really excited to do this because um, when you think of manufacturing, often uh, people think of factories, or it might be a bit dirty and smelly. Um, but actually, there's a lot of women involved in micro manufacturing from their home, adding to the local economy, um, trading, international trade, um, and making amazing things. But mostly they're hidden. So we're really happy to be uh, here doing this session today. Um, before we start, I want to... Uh, there's a lady called Amanda who runs, um, who runs Timbox Angel, and she's really poorly in bed and very disappointed to be missing this. Um, so I brought her a handbag. This is, um, she makes amazing things. Do check her out, and, uh, and she made this for me. Okay, so first of all, we're just going to introduce ourselves. So I'm Jane Binion, and I run the Growing Club. We run employment and enterprise training for women, and we're based in Lancaster. Hello, I'm Tamsin Coxhill. I am director of Fire Spiral Slings Limited. I uh, run a business that designs, manufactures, and retails woven baby wraps and blankets and accessories, all woven and made in Lancashire. Thank you. Hi, I'm Jeanette MacDonald and my company is Colourworks. Um, it's a very small business. I'm a natural dyer and I dye knitting yarns and uh, silk scarves and cotton scarves using natural dyes, so everything's plant-based. Brilliant. Okay, so what I want to know is how did you get involved in doing what you do, manufacturing? Do you want to start, Jeanette? Yes, well, um, I've always been creative. I've always made things. I love making stuff. I learned to knit when I was eight. I learned to sew when I was about five at primary school. And um, about four years ago, I found myself off sick from work after an operation. And so I decided to make some trousers, going, going to making some clothes. And um, I did that for a while. I went back to work. I was doing this part time, working part time. And it was kind of slow. I enjoyed what I was doing. And then I went on a course in natural dyeing, an intensive week course in natural dyeing. And I thought, that's it, I found what I really want to do. Um, and my, my first love is knitting and you know working with yarns and textiles and things like that. So I decided that that's what I was going to do. So I bought some knitting yarns, I bought some silk scarves and got dyeing in my kitchen. And um, that, it kind of went on from there really. So that's, that's how it all started. And it's just my love of, you know, creating things and finding that niche that I wanted to fill because there was, there's definitely a gap. And I think as people are going more towards, you know, thinking about looking after the planet, being more sustainable, synthetic dyes are generally made from coal, interestingly enough. And uh, they pollute the environment if they're used on an intensive scale, and they have done um, natural dyes when they use sensibly, um, don't pollute the environment they're, and they're beautiful to look at as well. You can get some fantastic colours from natural dyes. So, That's yeah. amazing. Yeah. Okay, and we'll come back to you in a bit to tell us more. How did you get into it, Tamsin? So, yeah, so we've been, um, probably about t 10 years ago, I had a two-year-old and a baby and I needed to, well, my, my smallest, my youngest baby wouldn't be put down, so I started carrying them in a sling. And um, I was doing that and I met who is now my business partner and we kind of met each other in baby groups and we got into using woven wraps which are a long piece of fabric to, to carry your baby and I think for, for me it was I want to buy more of these but there's nothing there that really floats my boat so I, and I said that to, to Jen and I said I reckon we could probably do this I think there's some weaving mills in Lancashire near just down the road from us I reckon we could probably get some woven you know what we fancy and what we could do so she said okay and Believe it or not, that's how it started. And here we are nine years later with, you know, a thriving business that sells, uh, sells our slings all over the world. So. Wow, that's amazing. Mm -hmm. OK, so um, I actually want you to show us what you've got. Do you want to do you want to start with the slings? Yeah. So and what you make? So we we make we don't just make slings anymore. So we started off making slings and actually when we stopped carrying our own babies because they got too big, we started thinking, well, what else can we do with our fabric? So now we, we do things like 
we make beautiful ponchos. Oh. Um, it's about ponchos. So all woven in Lancashire, sewn uh, locally, and uh, you know ethically sourced yarns. So it's all it's all very sustainable. Uh, we make scarves. So this is just cover my microphone up. <laughs> <laughs> But, yeah, so we do scarves and we, we design everything in-house, we source all the yarns in-house and we make lots and lots of beautiful things and, of course, blankets, Jane. You, yeah. you, have, you have one of my blankets. I am. It's so amazing. Wo <laughs> woven blankets, yeah. oh, they're thick so and heavy and, uh, and really we, we think about them as a piece of, of fabric and cloth that you have yes. in your life, you'll hand, hand down to your children, yeah. make it use oh. for picnic blankets, camping blankets, blankets on your bed, on your sofa, mm. and we actually sell an awful lot of blankets now as well, so we're not just a, not just a sling business. Um, but yeah, if we have time later, I might show you, I'll show you a sling as well. Fantastic. <laughs> show us what you've got, Jeanette. Right, okay. Well, I've got some scarves, which are dyed with natural dyes. Um, this is one of my recent ones. I love this colour, actually. It's, that's dyed with um, indigo and weld, which is a, a tall yellow plant, you have to dye it in order to get green. Um, you can't, funnily enough, you can't just get green from nature, from generally from one plant. You have to dye it yellow, then you have to over dye it with blue. So that's how that's done. There's another one that's dyed with a plant called Brazil wood, which is from a tree. Beautiful. There's more, a little, nice bit of tie dye, which apparently is back in fashion again. I don't think everyone out yeah. of fashion myself, but there we go. So that's indi a little bit of tie dyed, indigo dyed. And then I dye a lot of yarns as well. Oh. I also knit, so I've just brought along some of my knitted samples because I've got knitting machines. So I recently knitted a jumper. Like this is just a, a wow. practice run for the jumper. Yeah, um, these are all natural dyes because I've got um, three knitting machines as well. And one of the aims is to get more into knitting things as well, like ponchos is my, ne my next project, hopefully. And this is some of the stuff that I do. So these are the colours, amazingly, that you can get from natural dyes. So I think there's a bit of a misconception that natural dyes are kind of brown and, you know, dull colours. And they can be. You can you can use, an awful lot of plants will give you a dye, but it can tend to be, it can be quite a dull colour. You can get a lot of this kind of colour and kind of dull yellows and things like that. But onion skins, that started with onion skins. Wow. That's the first bath, and you keep the water, you reuse the water, dip it in again, and you get a yellow, which amazed me. I, couldn't, I didn't know what was going on when I pulled that out. But you can use one dye bath several times over if you just, you know, you keep reusing the dye bath till you get paler and paler colours. That's a cotton, which is lovely. I dye a lot of wool, but I've started getting into doing some vegan yarns. Oh, wow. Um, so that's because. Uh, you know, vegans obviously don't want to wear anything that comes from an animal, so they don't yeah. wool or silk or anything like that. So this is uh, linen and, and bamboo, which has actually come out quite soft. That's dyed with mm -hmm. indigo. And then I've started doing some dip dyeing to get some nice sort of stripes going on. So that's dyed with um, cochineal, which is beetle, um, anato, which is a seed, which is also used in uh, cooking in Mexico. You can actually eat it as a seasoning. And again, it, with weld. Um, I've got a lovely red, that, again that's some cochineal beetles. Um, what I love about green. this is I live in Galgate and Galgate is known as Rhubarb City. Exactly. Uh, it's a mill village and rhubarb was a really important part of um, our the silk process. Exactly. Yes, and um, it was. So I love that you're reclaiming this yes, and doing this yes. again. I've actually got some uh, rhubarb. I haven't used it yet, but you use it for mordanting. And the mordanting is when you yes. is what you do with it first to fix it. And it can also change the colours depending on what mordant you use. So with cochineal, um, you can also... That's done with cochineal and over-dyed with indigo. If you dye something red with cochineal, and then if you dip it in an alkali, like washing soda or soda ash, um, it will change colour. Wow. So it will go more towards the cerise end of things. So there you go, there's an amazing variety of colours you can get from natural dyes. I do a lot of sock yarns as well, which are quite popular with people are knitting socks. So Fantastic. Okay. So one of the things I want to check, I mean, you're busy, clearly, and making amazing things. What's the biggest challenge for you around 
manufacturing um, and growing, growing your business. Tamsin. So um, there's, there's probably challenges on two different levels. I think one of the challenges is being a mum of three. Um, so I've got three children, two in primary school, one in secondary school. And this term, I think I've had six days when they've all been at school. Yes. Um, so I work mm. from home. So there's the day to day challenge of actually getting work done and being a mum and doing all the stuff that, that lands on your lap with childcare, um, looking after the house, feeding everybody, keep, you know, keeping some semblance of, of sanity and cleanliness. <laughs> and then it's also about keeping the business going. And I think that, for example, summer holidays, Jen, my business partner and I, we have an agreement that actually we, we do the absolute bare minimum with the business over the summer because we've got three children each mm. and Otherwise, it just gets too stressful. You can't, you can't do everything and be everything. You, yeah. you know, you have to know, you have to be boundaried. And that's something that I've only learned maybe in the last few years. Try to do everything, be everything, you break. Mm. Um, so you have, to, you have to balance. And I think if there were no children involved, there'd be no company because they wouldn't have started doing it. <laughs> but if there were no children, yeah. we probably would have grown. Yeah. So that's a growth challenge, yeah. I think. Um, but saying that, I get to do the school run every day. I could choose not to do that. I could choose childcare and I could do more work on the business. But I choose to keep my business as it is because it suits me and it mm. suits my family. Um, but then other challenges, manufacturing challenges, probably blankets. We, I think um, our current run of blankets we are anticipating being woven in the next few weeks. We, d we put the order back in in March or April. So there's really long lead times that, um, that when you're fairly, when you're small, you're having to predict the future quite a lot mm. and you're going you're having to to work out what your cash flow situation is going to be six seven months down the line and what your customer demand is going to be so it's not a, as simple as uh, I, I suppose possibly with, with you Jeanette if you've um run out of blue wool mm. you can make some more blue wool mm. we we don't get that we've we've got the challenge of, of having to kind of uh, predict the future a little bit more mm. and um it's always a can we afford it if we if we make it, we'll sell it. But will we? And it's it's um, yeah. I, and I think nine years in, we can be fairly confident with what we're doing. But the lead times are the most challenging thing at the moment in the manufacturing process for us. I think that's raised two really important points. And just uh, just to remember that women's businesses have been really really impacted through the pandemic because um, of having to homeschool. And then when children went back to school, everyone got ill. So that, that isn't over. But also the, um, the supply chain. So one of the things Amanda said, she works with leather. And getting leather, and we're not producing leather in the UK, which is crazy. Yeah. Uh, she's having to import. And also um, because she isn't uh, wanting huge amounts, um, it's harder to get and more expensive. What challenges are you facing? Well, I'm still growing, I suppose, because I started off when I moved into my current workshop is when everything kind of kicked off properly. And that was in July last year, which was in between lockdowns. I mean, what a place to, you know, what a time to start. But anyway, um, the first lockdown, I was, I kind of just started. And I had some scarves and some of the yarns online. So before I, you know, kind of started in the, in the current workshop. And the first lockdown, I actually did sell quite a lot of stuff because people were buying online. Yes. You know, they were stuck at home and they were needing presents for Easter or whatever, birthdays. And so they were buying from home and that was fine. Um, but it has been, it's been, it has been a real challenge. It's been very slow. Um, it's just me in my business, just me on my own, nobody else. Um, I have an elderly father who I, you know, I mean, he doesn't need full time care, but I take him shopping and I yeah. have, you know, I have my commitments to him. And of course, there's also the house to try and keep some semblance of order. Uh, I've got a teenage daughter living at home. Um, so even though she, you know, she's not, I'm not having to homeschool or anything like that, teenagers have their own, mm. you know, demands, I suppose. Um, so the lack of time i mean if there were more hours in the day or days in the week then yeah i'd be more tired but i'd get more done that seems but it's yeah, it's, yeah, yeah, yeah. It, it's time management I find okay. time management is one of the things that i find quite difficult it's kind of splitting myself into several different pieces and trying to be in the workshop you know at 
I can't be in the workshop from nine till five every day. Sure. It's not like sure. that. Yeah. And one of the things Amanda said is um, a challenge she's seen is being taken seriously as a woman in micro manufacturing. I mean, you're making the most amazing products, and I know they're incredibly high quality. Um, but she said, being a woman in this field, she's not always taken seriously. Do you? Are you getting any of that? Um, I think in the early days, definitely. I think mm. people thought it was a hobby and that yes. I grow out of it. And even from my parents, okay. you know, mm. yeah, yeah. that's... and grow uh, out of it. Yeah, <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> or something, but I did, didn't go out of it. It grew. <laughs> and um, I think possibly because I've built a really big bubble around myself, um, I tend to float around in it and talk okay. to people about... So I did an interview last week um, with a, a VIP baby-wearing business group on Zoom and... You know, they were they completely thought that we were, were knew that we were sort of top sustainable rap company in the UK, yeah. and they knew all that mm -hmm. about us. And that actually, I didn't realise that people thought that. So I think possibly seeing other people taking me seriously okay. has given me more confidence, which yeah. is wonderful. Uh, so yeah. maybe the opposite of what you said. Okay. Uh, but on the other side, I'm also an entrepreneur in residence at Lancaster University, yeah. and I got an email through a couple of weeks ago from them saying we're looking for a female entrepreneur to mentor one of our students. Mm. And my reply was, I'll put my hand up for that if I'm businessy enough for you. And again, okay. you know, so it, it's, uh, I, I think, possibly me not taking myself seriously okay. or... Yeah, 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 so yeah, okay. I mean, you, you've been doing international trade for a few years yeah. now, haven't you? Yeah, okay, but still not... Yeah, but I don't have a blazer and smart trousers. Really And I feel that, that that identity feels okay. like that's what's expected. Yes. Um, but yeah, okay. it's interesting. It's really interesting. Um, gosh, I'm aware that uh, I don't want to talk about this all day, but we've got a time limit. So I think what I'm going to ask is, what would you like to see put in place? I mean, there are a lot of women in micro manufacturing, a lot. What do you think? could be put in place um, to enable those women doing that to to grow. Um, for example, you know, I make nettle soup, okay, and um, and it goes down really well. And I was thinking, God, you know, I could um, I could sell this, but then I had no idea how mm. how to do that. So yeah. I, and maybe it'll be something I do in retirement. I don't know, but just no idea where you start. So what might you um, recommend? be put in place to support more people in micro manufacturing. Mm. Well, I mean, luckily, Jane, we've got things like the growing club, okay, which yeah. is fantastic, yeah. I have to say. Um, I would like to take more advantage of some of the things that you offer. Like, um, I think you did a peer mentoring course, mm. didn't you? Yeah. Mm. But did because that. my time is so limited, yeah. I didn't yeah. have the time. Yeah. Or maybe I just didn't think I could make the time Okay. in order to to do that you know it's valuable that kind of thing yeah. that kind of mentoring and having someone else who i think if i if i could meet someone else who who does what i do yeah that would really make a big difference okay. for me you know maybe who was a few steps ahead of me yeah. and i can talk to them about you know how do i how do i kind of scale up how do i get to where you are because i i know it's possible and it's also it's having confidence in myself yes. if i don't have you know, if I don't take myself seriously, nobody else is going to. And so, but yes, I mean, things like the Growing Club are brilliant. There are things out there, it's just accessing them because things like um, uh, Boost Lancashire run all kinds of courses, mm. but most of them are business to business. And I need business to customer. Okay. That's what I, I yeah, so well. I've looked yes. at a lot of them and yes, it, it, it's not for me. And I look at these things and I think, oh, that's big business, business to business, and that's not for yeah. me, I'm, I'm, I'm this big. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So the mentor and that and that's been talked about for years that mm. women um, yeah women running businesses do so much better when they have a mentor mm. absolutely so that yeah that still we need to keep talking about that what about you terms and what do you think so I, I think that um, as, a, as a slightly different business I've got different needs and my needs recently have been a lot around um, exporting to Europe post brexit yeah and um, finding out that I need commodity codes and um, that there are various different options for shipping to Europe. And there's information out there on the internet, but it is not aimed at businesses of my size. 
Um, for example, I've been trying to get a system set up where my European customers pay duty to me yeah. and then I pay it as tax. But most shipping companies don't want to know because of my volumes. So trying to set something up that's going to put my sales hopefully back to where they were pre, pre this 1st of July um, catastrophe that was uh, the, yeah. the EU shipping, um, I feel that there's just nothing there for me and I'm making lots of phone calls and I'm knocking on lots of doors and I'm being turned away because um, oh, you know, you're not a big enough business to, to do that or it's going to cost mm. you £3,000 a year to do that. And mm. I still, you know, my business to Europe is important, it's yeah. really important. It, it, it's little bits, but little bits add up and all the little businesses like mine that are doing, you know, whose sales to Europe have fallen because of this mess, yeah. you know, we need to be supported and for, for the good of the country. Not just yeah. for the good of our individual businesses, but you know, we, we bring money into the UK. We employ people. Exactly, exactly. So that's my big, big bugbear at the moment. If anyone can help on that, please, <laughs> please get in touch. Uh, I know that we were uh, asking on LinkedIn and everything, weren't we? Who can help? Yeah, and, it's only yeah. got worse. Recently, yeah. You know, since July, it's got worse. Yeah, so yeah. It's, uh, okay, yeah, yeah, definitely, if anyone can help from that. Okay, what are your plans going forward? What's your dreams? What do you want to do to that? Um, well, I've got all sorts of plans. Um, I would like to increase the knitting, the um, knitwear side of things. So, you know, I was saying like the ponchos and things like that. Um, at the moment, I'm starting to supply some shops. So instead of selling mm -hmm. to the customer, yeah. then I'm starting to sell wholesale. And that kind of came out the blue. Okay. Um, the two wool shops in Lancaster came to me and said, Wow, would you, brilliant. you know, Fantastic. supply us with? And I thought, oh, actually, that's that's brilliant. a good thing. Are you B to B now, then? I am B to B now. Yes, it's only just happened. Yes, that's <laughs> true. Actually, I hadn't thought of that. Yes, um, I because of the lockdowns and there's been no uh, big fairs or country fairs or you know the shows in the things in stately homes and stuff yeah. like that. Because that's what I was hoping to do last year. Then I'm hoping next year to do things like. Um, Woolfest, which is a big, yeah. uh, in Cockermouth, yeah. it's Amazing. a big wool fair. Angela where does that, doesn't she? Yeah. Yes, yeah. So that's the kind of, I want to start doing the big affairs. I'm yeah. doing Lancaster Brewery, uh, Lancaster Brewery Christmas Fair, which is, you know, the stalls are more expensive, but you make more money. Yeah. So in the future, I'd like to do more of those big affairs. It's just a case of getting the things out to the customer. Yeah. Or scaling up to wholesale, in which case I would have to increase my um, dyeing capacity really, mm. which mean, means buying bigger containers to put on okay. the stove basically, yeah. Yeah, and yeah, I was thinking about the, the thing about um, wholesale is one of the issues is, um, I don't know if it's true or if it's just something that people hold in their head about it's handmade, it's made locally, it's high standard, but then you have to charge for that. Yes. So I remember there was a clothes shop that wanted uh, local women, that wanted to sell clothes made by local women, but then you can't compete on cost from what's coming in from China. That is the no. problem. That yeah. is the problem. And yes. so that, but we used to kind of have to have this pride around made in Britain, and we lost that somewhere, yeah. Yeah. and we're going for cheap now. But mm. I think we need to do something about having that pride again in high quality, mm. handmade mm. things um, that last. That you mm. just you, yeah. you, you spend two pounds on a t-shirt. You don't care if it goes into landfill. Yeah. You spend, you know, fifteen pounds on it. Maybe you care a little bit more, and you look mm. after it and you use it a bit longer. Yes. and that's I'm really passionate about that side of things. Yeah, mm. you know, with producing high quality, sustainable, ethically sourced things that you know yarns that are going to be used for years and years and sold on and sold on mm. and you know it's I think that's so important. No absolutely so what are your what are your plans and your hopes and dreams? Yeah so next five years short-term dream is sort out Europe. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yes. yeah. good job. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah. Sort out my European customers so that yeah. they actually start receiving what's being sent to them yeah. um, and I think as my children get older and Jen's children get older we will have more time yeah and I think that the business will naturally be given more time and will potentially go in the direction it goes in um, we're really really keen to get seen by pregnant people and mm. people who are new babies who might not have considered using a product like ours so that's that's our, our focus for a lot of the work we're putting into the website is aimed at entry level 
people to the world of, of woven wraps and baby slings. And um, we, so we're passionate about people doing it because it's such a valuable thing to do for parent-child attachment, uh, comfort, development, and just general happiness wearing beautiful cloth. Yeah. So um, I think that what's important to me though is that there is a balance, there's a work-life balance, and I'm really keen on maintaining that over the next five years. And the business doesn't grow at the expense of my family or myself, mm. so. No, absolutely, it's no good. If I mean, one of the things we talk a lot about with the growing club is if you don't look after yourself, what happens to your business? Yeah. So mm. that's self-care, it's priority. So we've got some questions, fabulous, yeah. okay. Great, really interesting discussion there, so thank you. Um, some of the questions that are coming from the Q&A, someone would like to know more about your supply chains and sort of what sort of impact do you have on your local economy? Okay, so I can answer that one. Um, so supply chains for us, we um, try and use, well, we, we source our yarns for weaving either from directly from the weaving mill who will then source it. So they're obviously getting a cut out of that. So that money's going back into a, a Lancashire based business. Um, we also use dead stock yarn that is brought up by a small company in um, in Berry, that sort of way. So again, we're buying yarn from local businesses uh, where we can. So that's for me, that's that's supply chain. We get our labels woven in Chorley. In fact, um, we could get our labels woven in China for a fraction of the price, but we weave them in Chorley. So again, there's that impact, and um, our sewing is done in Preston. So it's all it's for me. Everything is kept as close knit as possible for both um, for sustainability for the local economy and for environment and you're spinning your own wool aren't you I do spin my own wool as yeah. well actually yes yeah. yes <laughs> I'm involved in a project that um, takes wool from local flocks and uh, spins it and then we dye it and then it gets knitted up into garments Amazing. yes that's great to hear lots of local impact there uh, what is your relationship like in terms of with the big stakeholders in the region for manufacturing? No, that's not um, something that I kind of deal with really in terms of big stakeholders now. My business is very small. What do you mean by that question? Do, oh, you, and you didn't ask the question. Yeah. I mean, would you like to have more of a relationship in terms of the big stakeholders in manufacturing at the moment or um are you sort of happy with how you so business collaboration at the moment? yeah would you like to see not more being collaboration up yeah I, sorry I, I i just remembered you not asking the question yeah, yeah. okay I, mean, I use so a weaving some collaboration mill. yeah yeah so, so i use yeah. a weaving mill that weave a lot of cloth for a lot of other companies as well and i like to think that the the amount that we weave you know puts puts tea on the table for somebody there so there's that relationship, but otherwise we, you know, we we don't exist really with any impact from anybody, anybody mm. else really. It's, mm. uh, and I think one of the problems is so much manufacturing has been lost in this country because people want cheap. Yeah. Um, you know, we know women uh, manufacturing that couldn't get, uh, they couldn't get to make their things in the country. Only um, Chinese suppliers would deal with them. Mm. Uh, and so, you know, we've really got to be looking at addressing that more. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. And I know you've already discussed uh, Europe a fair bit. One of the questions that has just come in is around, are you having problems um, or issues with it sporting at the moment? Um, which I think you've covered a fair yeah. bit there. Yeah. yeah. Um, what support specifically do you think you need um, to combat those issues? For me, it feels that there's no joined up approach to solving the problem. It feels that there's there are there's issues with customs, um, which is a big one for us. Is we're sending parcels out, we believe they're labelled up correctly. They're coming back. Mm. Oh. Um, you know, the customs paid shipping, and it just. It, I've spoken to my local post office, they say, yes, we've heard a lot of this. So there's a lot of stuff going on, but is is anybody really aware of it? And, you know, as, as a, a bigger picture, can it be approached rather than lots of individual people saying, this is wrong, this is wrong? You know, is, is something going to happen to at a higher level to, to try and resolve things? Or are we stuck with what's been agreed and how things are going to be? And I think a lot of 
what possibly is affecting us, parcels coming back, is disgruntled European countries saying, we don't want your stuff. Mm. Um, you know, we've made our bed. We're lying in it. Yeah. Yeah. So. Are you selling anything overseas? I, know I don't you sell. Do no, I don't sell anything well, overseas at the moment, just okay. to the UK, because I was a bit worried about things like yeah. commodity codes, yeah. the silk scarves. Yeah. Because I, I did used to sell some things to American customers. But then I got a bit worried that I was supposed to be um, using these commodity codes. Yeah. So I thought, I'm just going to sell to the UK for now. Okay. And maybe when I get so, bigger, that's something I'll look into if it's not still a nightmare. It's like which this support is, needs to be there because it's yes, not it does. clear. You go on the no, it's not clear. UK site and look at commodity codes. It's and lists honestly, and lists. Honestly, you need a degree in commodity you codes. You do, I yes. Think, to, yes. To even, yeah. So it's, it's that sort of support that yes. would help you expand as well, wouldn't exactly, it? Exactly, yes, it would, yes. Because I'm missing out on quite a lot yeah. by not selling abroad. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. definitely. Great, thank you. So that's all our questions. Really insightful session there, and hopefully your stories can help uh, get a wider discussion going and help some inspire some more people to get into micro manufacturing. So thank you. And also, I just want to say, when you're thinking about doing your shopping this Christmas, shop local, <laughs> yeah. shop from people that are, are making high quality goods. And I'll just show you. Whoops. Amanda's handbag again. Amanda, get well soon. Um, you know, I know it's easy to shop online and it's great, but if you want good quality, come and find your local uh, manufacturers.